عندي 106 سنين 106 سنين الحمد لله <تصفيق> Today is designed by our guest Stephanie Saldana, and it's designed for you, children, and your parents. We're so glad you're here. Stephanie will be telling you about people from this region, and you can see the Nile River in Egypt. You can see the Red Sea immediately to the east. Up above, there's the Sinai Peninsula. And uh, they say that most human beings walked out of Africa across that tiny bit of land to find the rest of the world. Uh, slightly east of Sinai, you see the big peninsula, the Arabian Peninsula. And in there on the western coast of the Arabian Peninsula is the city of Mecca, which is a focal point for Muslims. Uh, the Kaaba, a central shrine, is located in Mecca, and that's the direction toward which Muslims pray. Uh, going further east, you find the Persian Gulf. And north from the Persian Gulf, uh, where two rivers meet, the Euphrates and the Tigris, we have today's Iraq. Um, and then if we move our cor cursor up and to the west a little bit, we will see Syria and other people that we're gonna learn about uh, come from Syria. Further west still, going back to the top of the Nile River, is the Mediterranean Sea. And it's important to know that a lot of the refugees, the refugees about which Stephanie will tell you, tell us, uh, are crossing the Mediterranean, and it's a very dangerous crossing, and they're doing that to reach safety in Europe. So we'll we'll get to to know those stories. Let me invite Stephanie onto the uh, onto camera right now. I'll introduce her to you. Stephanie Saldana is uh, one of the world's experts on intangible cultural heritage. She researches and collects these stories of songs and recipes and traditions that give us identity and purpose and heritage. Hi, it's great to be she, here. Uh, she got her master's at Harvard Divinity School. Hi, Stephanie, welcome. Stephanie is joining us from Jerusalem, where she lives at the Tantor Ecumenical Center with three children and her husband. And uh, so now that you're here, Stephanie, what drew, drew you, what attracted you to the study of cultural heritage? Well, I've been thinking about that a lot lately um, because I don't know, and people keep asking me. Um, I think it's because um, I'm Latina, I'm from San Antonio, and uh, I grew up in, in a world where every year for school in seventh grade, we took Texas history. And um, Texas history was a year about the history of Texas. My father's family was from Spain and my mother's family was from Mexico. Most of the people I knew were Latino and our stories never showed up. So we grew up feeling that our stories weren't in history. Um, that history started with the Battle of the Alamo, but I knew that I had a history. Um, I knew that my mom was teaching me about her history through our recipes. I knew that my dad was teaching me about his history through his stories. Um, and when I went into the world, I learned that the world worked like that. Some people, told history, but it wasn't really the history the rest of us were living. It was what they thought history was. And so from my childhood, I knew there was another story to be told. And when I moved to the Middle East, I started seeing with the same eyes of my childhood. Um, what are the stories being told through clothes? What are the stories being told through songs? Um, who are the people that other people don't think are important, but who are making history? All of us are making history. So I think it comes from um, my own life and my own sense that my, my family stories weren't being told. And is that why you 
appreciate collecting other people's stories? Most people um, are mostly interested I, in their own stories, you know? <laughs> um, well, I went to the Middle East when I was 22 and I just loved it. And I loved the people and I loved listening to them and I loved learning from them and I loved learning their language. And they have great stories. They have some of the oldest stories in the world. Um, and as a writer, I love stories. And so it was a great place to live um, if you love stories. And I've just never stopped collecting stories. Well, I'm here with my set of markers and my paper. Hope everybody else is too. I'm looking forward to what we're gonna learn and what we're gonna draw and what we're gonna do. Thank you, Stephanie. Right. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm so, so happy that you're here today. This is the first day that I've ever, ever given a webinar, especially for young people. But it means a lot to me because I have three children, one Carmel four, my son Sebastian is nine, and my son Joseph is 12. Um, and I'm always talking to them about my journeys and the people that I meet. Um, as you know, I live in Jerusalem and where I am, it's seven o'clock at night. Um, and today I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about my work with refugees and to share with you some of the incredible stories that I've heard from them. Um, when I was in my 20s, I lived in a country called Syria um, in the Middle East, and that's where I learned to speak Arabic. Let me just take my camera off so you can see some of these pictures. That's at the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus. I really loved the, the people there. I met a lot of, of, of friends and I learned to speak Arabic and it really has a, a special place in my heart. Well, in 2011, Syria um, had a, the beginning of a civil war, which still continues until today. And millions of people had to run a wall to escape, to leave their homes in order to find safety. In fact, today, 6.6 .6 million people from Syria are refugees, which means that they had to seek safety in another country. Um, millions more, we call them internally displaced people, had to seek safety inside of Syria, but in a place that's not their own. That means that today more than half of the country is displaced. Around 13 million people in one country have left their homes. In 2014, that war went across the border into Iraq. And there are hundreds of thousands of people who also had to leave their homes. Um, there are people just like you and me, moms and dads and their kids. Um, and they became, so what is a refugee? Or who is a refugee? A refugee is a person, let me see, what is it? Refugee is a person who has been forced to flee their country because of war, persecution, or violence. When this happens, they find themselves living in another country. And that experience can be really difficult. Sometimes they don't speak the language. Um, sometimes they might have to live in a tent or in a home that's not like the home they're used to. Um, sometimes the temperature is different, the food is different. Sometimes the children don't get to go to school and sometimes the parents can't work. So it can be really, really hard. Um, a few years ago, I started a project I'm gonna to talk to you about today. It's called Mosaic Stories. Um, this project allowed me to travel around the world and meet some of these people who had escaped from Iraq and Syria and to talk to them about their lives. These people became my teachers. They taught me a lot about Syria and Iraq but they also taught me about what it means to be really brave. Um, so today I'm gonna just share some of their stories with you. This is, uh, I'm just showing you some of the things that they saved. They saved music, they saved embroidery, they saved their recipes. 
water recipes. We're going to start with a story from Karakosh, Iraq, which is um, a city just southeast of, of Mosul in northern Iraq. You can see where it is there on the map, where that picture is of Hannah, who I'm about to talk about. Let's close it so you can see the map. This is Hannah. Um, I met her a few years ago in 2016. And I asked her when I met her um, if she had been able to take anything with her when she had to leave her city of Karakosh. Um, and she said, no, she had to leave really, really quickly um, with her family, her husband and three children. And so she didn't get to bring anything with her. Um, and when she got to safety, first they were in Northern Iraq, then they went to Jordan, that's where I met her. She was really sad because she didn't have anything from home. And so she decided that she was going to sew her city into a dress. What does that mean, you say? There it is. This is Hannah's dress. It's called a shawl. It's a traditional dress from her village, but it's not just a dress, it's a story. Um, and I'm gonna show you a little bit what this dress is telling us, what the story of this dress is. Let me just take you to a better picture. There we go, this is Hannah's dress. In the top right-hand corner as you're looking at it, you'll see what look like some strange letters. That's Syriac, a dialect of Aramaic, um, the language that Jesus spoke. It's one of, it's a very ancient language and it's almost extinct, but that's the language that Hannah spoke every day of her life. Her community were some of the last speakers of Aramaic in the world. In the middle, you'll see some wheat and some grapes. Those are religious symbols. She's Christian from the Christian community of Iraq. But her family also grew wheat and grew grapes. You see her name in Arabic on the other side. She spoke Arabic too. You see a big red roofed church. That's the church of Al Tahara, the largest church in Iraq. It was in her village and she sang in the choir there. You see another church called the Church of Marbachna and Sarah. It looks like a bunch of cookie cutter things right in a row. That was another church in her village. Then you see this wedding dance. That's called the Debke. It's danced all over the Middle East. And you can see the old people in that picture are wearing traditional dress and the young people are wearing modern dress. You can see people wearing white and black. Those are from another village called Bashika. So they have a different traditional dress. Then you can see her house, the pink house, her well, her donkey, all of the things that make up her life. So there you go. Just to help you understand, as I looked more into the dress, I saw pictures. This dance is this dance. This is a picture of the dance which was taken in her village before the community fled in 2014. This church, is this church with a man by the name of Johnny Aklimo standing on the roof. This church is this church. And this is Hannah wearing her dress. Over time, I met lots of people from her village who when they left brought their dresses with them or sewed their dresses. Here you can see some others. There's a shawl. There's another one. There you go. Isn't it amazing how much of a story a dress can tell? Um, what I love is that each one of them is similar. So we can see that they're from the same community, but each one is really unique too. No two dresses are ever the same. So I asked each of you to have a piece of paper and some crayons with you. Um, one thing that Hannah told me 
is that when she went to the market to prepare to sew her dress, she had to think about what colors she was going to buy. She only had so much money and she needed to buy thread. And she had to think, what are the colors that express who I am? What colors am I carrying inside of me? Let me just bring you to her again. There's Hannah and her colors. So if you could just take out your piece of paper and choose some colors, choose some colors. You don't have to think about it. Just choose some colors, draw some lines and start to think in colors. What I want you to think about is the fact that there are different languages that we have and different ways of talking. We don't just talk using words. So I'm gonna do it too. And we're just gonna take a minute and we're going to fill up a piece of paper with some colors that express maybe what you're feeling right now or who you are, just to help you start thinking in the language of color. I'm gonna do that right now while you are too, I hope. I hope some of the parents are doing some colors too. I'm doing some of this and it feels not as natural to me as it did when I was younger. I'm sorry, I've lost that sense of just, you know, put it out there in color. I didn't know I had so much pink inside of me. <laughs> um, so this is you moving in a different direction. So now I want everyone on the same piece of paper or maybe on a different piece of paper to just draw something from your life which is important to you. Just quickly, it doesn't have to be perfect, it doesn't have to be in detail. It can be a place or a fruit or a tree. Just draw it and know that by drawing it, you're beginning to tell a story about the world you carry inside of your heart. I'll just take a moment while people are drawing to mention we have a, an area where you can write questions for Stephanie in your control panel. Please feel free. I see a couple of questions there already so that I can ask those of her as we go along. Stephanie, this is a message for you from Sister Martha Ann from San Antonio. She writes, this is so excellent, right? She asks, can we get a recording of this to share with our groups here in San Antonio? And she, she says, say that again without me interrupting you. Um, I said, yes, and I would also love, love, love to present to them myself. Um, so please just share with Martha my... Ann. Yeah, be in touch with, with us at Abraham Path, uh, connect at abrahampath.org, or you can write to me, Anisa, A-N-I-S-A, at abrahampath.org, or write directly to Stephanie, and we'll help set that up for you. She also wanted you to know, Stephanie, that your father is smiling on you. So I just wanted to say here that Hannah, as you can tell, this, this 
this dress taught me so much that I actually followed it all the way to Iraq. And I visited all of the places on the dress. That's how accurate the dress is. Um, today, you'll be happy to know that um, Hannah and her family, her husband and her three children, and now her, her first grandchild are safely in Australia. Um, so she taught me not only about her village in Iraq, which the day she left it, 44,000 people fled that village, the entire village left. Um, but she also reminded me that all of us carry stories inside of us. From Aleppo, Syria, I wanna bring you a story. <laughs> Anissa will, re will, will remember these two guys. This is two, these are two friends. They are Abdullah Nashef, he's the one on the right hand side of the screen, and Amr Nashef on the left hand screen, um, the one with his hand on his cheek. They're friends from Aleppo, Syria, and they had to escape the war in 2015. Um, they had to take that scary, dangerous route across the uh, across the sea that you saw earlier there. When I met them, they had arrived in Europe and they were in Amsterdam. So when they arrived, Amar, who's the one with his hand on his cheek, realized he also hadn't brought anything with him. He hadn't had time, it was very dangerous. They had to escape quickly. But what did he have? Well, Amar was a chef and Aleppo was famous all over the Middle East for its food. So he realized that he had carried inside of him hundreds and hundreds of recipes for his city's famous food. Now, Abdullah, he's something else. He was a young businessman in the famous market of Aleppo, where the people working there were famous for learning lots of languages. When he arrived in Amsterdam, he learned Dutch and English within the space of a year. So when I met them, he was already fluent in English and fluent in Dutch. They knew each other before the war, but they had no idea that they were going to arrive in the same city in Europe. When they saw each other, he said, oh my gosh, I know how to run a business and Amar knows how to cook. So they started a catering business together called Cook Bestellen. Cook Bestellen means order a cook. And in their work, they're keeping the delicious food of Aleppo alive. You can see this is Kibbe Labania. This is one of the feasts that they made. Now, when I talked to them, we talked about food, 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 food. They talked mostly about Kibbe. Kibbe is a famous kind of meatball that we have in the Middle East. And Amar said, don't be shy to say that there were a hundred types in Aleppo. They used to actually write love poems about Kibbe in Aleppo. Aleppo was famous for its pistachios, its olive oil, its red peppers, and its pomegranates. Amar told me, in other places, when you see a rose, you smell it. But we took roses and we made rose petal jam out of it. They taught me how much food can be a way of remembering where we come from. I follow people and their food everywhere. This is a recipe for biryani from Iraq. This is actually Kuwaiti food, which was in a refugee camp in, in Lesbos in Greece. So I thought in honor of Amar and Abdullah, you could think for a moment about what is some of the heritage, cultural heritage of food that you carry with you? Do you have a special recipe that you learned from your parents? Do you have a food that brings back a memory for you? Do you have something that is maybe making you think about a feast day or a holiday. So just take that piece of paper and write down food that is for you part of your heritage or part of your, your memory. Um, just write it down so you can think about it. I'm writing down tamales. Tamales are a kind of Mexican food that it takes a long, long time to make. It takes so long to make them that when I was growing up, we had a special party called a tamalada, where we made them in groups. And then everybody would take some home. 
Um, I thought about those when I came to the Middle East, when people were making stuffed grape leaves in the same way as when I grew up. Now, those of you who are listening, what I would ask you is that maybe the next time you know that somebody is making that dish or that food, maybe you can ask if you could learn. That's what I've been doing since I started this project. You're learning a story, and one day you'll be able to teach that story to other people through food. Around half of the, the refugees in the world are under the age of 18. That's why it's so important for young people like you to learn about refugees, because you're gonna, you're gonna grow up in a world where lots of people your age have been displaced. Refugees are so brave. And many of them have made really difficult journeys. They're also participating in saving the heritage of their country. Look at these young people. They're the Abu Rustam dance troupe. And I met them in a refugee camp in Jordan where they perform traditional sword dances at the weddings. Muhammad, the youngest, is only five years old. Well, now he's older, but then he was only five years old. It's so inspiring to see what young people can do. Isn't that amazing? Their costumes are from the traditional fabric, um, the traditional textiles of Syria. Everything they're doing is a kind of saving of their heritage. It's so amazing. Now I'm gonna take you into one last story from home, sort of two last stories. This is Nama Mohammed El Shabali. She's from Dara. And she told me about her trees, olive trees, lemon trees, oranges, apricots, pears, grapes, and figs. She told me about her garden. There were chickpeas, eggplants, and zucchini. And the tiny in the refugee camp where she lived, you can see she's making cheese, she's making olives. She's trying to keep the, the, the heritage of her food and of her produce alive. It was there nearby that I learned one of my favorite stories. This is makdus. Makdus is a kind of pickled stuffed eggplant from southern Syria. People love to serve it for breakfast. I learned that when refugees were, were escaping the war, they were bringing the seeds to their eggplants with them when they went to other countries. Why were they doing that? Because they needed these special eggplants to keep making makduks. And so when the first ones arrived and they realized those eggplants weren't there, they told their relatives, if you have to come, bring your seeds. It was hope the size of a sea. I love that story. And Makdus is delicious. And this is Abdul Latif. Abdul Latif is also from Homs. And he had to escape with his family. And when he arrived in Jordan, he was really, really sad. Um, he lived for three years feeling um, a little bit hopeless. He couldn't work. And he really missed his wife's orchards and gardens. So one day he woke up and he told me, I want to do something with my life. And he decided to plant this little garden that you see here. You see, everything in his garden is saving the memory of something from his garden back home. This is mint. This is, I think, shad or maybe onions. He told me all he wanted to do was plant tomatoes. After I met him, he sent me this picture from a few months later of the tomatoes he planted. And then I learned, do you know what he did with them? He gave them away as presents. Abdul Latif taught me that sometimes the hope that we carry with us is as small as a seed. But when we plant it, something grows. So for the last thing I want you to do is to take out your piece of paper and think, do you have a tree, a flower that has special meaning to you? Can you draw it?
What I'm noticing, Stephanie, is that I want to draw a rose, but I can't remember what their leaves look like. I need to look more closely. I do remember there are thorns. Mm -hmm. It's interesting what, what I find I take for granted in terms of what I see and have seen so much of. I'm drawing a fig tree. And that's because one of my favorite people, Naomi Shiev Nye, who is a poet in, in San Antonio, Texas, but Palestinian, she wrote a poem called My Father and the Fig Tree about his, her father escaping, um, escaping here, my city, Jerusalem, and moving to Texas, and always being sad that he didn't have a fig tree. And one day calling her and doing what she called a fig tree dance because he got a new home with a fig tree in the backyard and it was like he got home again. So now there's a fig tree where I live and I always think of him when I see that fig tree. And aren't figs right off the tree a, a treat? So I also took a picture to end with of one of my favorite trees. This is the almond tree and this grows right outside where I live. You can see how much is expressed in a single tree. So we're going to go to question and answers now, but let me just finish by saying today, one in every 100 people on the planet are displaced, if you can believe it. One in every 100 people on the planet have lost their homes. Um, and as I told you, around half of those people are under the age of 18. So that means a lot of people who are young, a lot of people who are your age, if you're young and watching this, have lost their home. So it's really important that we learn about them because we're all part of the same human family. And when we read about them and meet them, we discover that we have things to learn about food and history and music, but also about what it means to be brave and resilient in difficult times. So I hope you started to learn a little bit about some of them today, and it's just the beginning of your journey. But I hope you also learn that all of us have stories to tell. All of us are carrying stories within us. And when we learn to tell our stories and to listen to other people's stories, the world becomes just a better and more beautiful and diverse place. So just to say one last time, half of the world's refugees are under the age of 18. They could be your friends or classmates. And so it's your generation who's really going to decide how we can welcome them and learn from them and build a more inclusive, peaceful planet. All of us are planting seeds. And you, each one of you has a seed that only you can plant. Um, and I look forward to watching it grow. So I'm ready for questions um, or comments, or if you want to share some of the things you discovered when you were drawing, I would love to hear that too. Thank you so much. And thank you, Stephanie. Um, it's interesting as we live through this period of, of a public health crisis and um, some of us feel contained inside and are restless and having a, uh, you know, a difficult time with being patient with ourselves and our siblings and our family members, uh, what we can learn from people who have uh, learned even from more difficult circumstances, uh, how to be ho hopeful and how to keep up their spirit. You know, I think there's a lot to learn there. So we have one question. So a uh, question here that wants you to talk about oral versus written history and the way people recount their ancestry sure um i would say um in the middle east in a lot of the places where i work on purpose i work in places where people for example maybe this generation um People my age read and write, but their parents and grandchildren and grandparents didn't necessarily know how to read or didn't know how to write. Or for example, in the first story I told, 
they only spoke Aramaic, but those people in that village, they weren't reading or writing Aramaic. It was just a spoken language. And so that means that most of the stories were told orally. What that means also is people have incredible memories. So you can sit with people and sometimes they will be able to tell a story for three hours in a row in incredible detail without forgetting things. And there's also things worked in. They'll repeat things that are important. There's a certain music to it. And I really, it just hits me in a different way. Um, I find one of the things with working with refugees, refugees have to fill out a lot of paperwork. And a lot of that paperwork is about telling what happens to them. Often when they tell what happens to them, they have to sort of tell a specific story. This happened and this happened and this happened. And they sort of get used to telling that story. So if I were just to say, what happened to you? They would tell me that story. But if I talk to them about food or I talk to them about trees or I talk to them about their music, then suddenly it's easier to talk. And over time, we talk about other things. We talk about the war, we talk about family, we talk about, but I find that actually talking about cultural heritage is a way to allow people to talk on their own terms. Um, I think that in a lot of places in the world, when we focus on written history, we just eliminate huge portions of the population, um, especially women. Um, I also think that I don't just work on oral history. I work on how you know recipes can tell stories. From a recipe, I can tell what are the trees where you live? Um, what are the festivals where you live? Um, how do people tell time? People often tell times, I, I spoke to many people who don't know when they were born. They don't know what year they were born. They, they measure time by seasons, you know? Um, you, you move into a different rhythm of life. Um, people, I've met people who make perfumes. Their perfumes are telling a story. I really believe that we need to expand what we think a book is. I think a, a dress can be a book. A bottle of perfume can be a book. A tree uh, can tell a story. How many stories have I heard that start with a tree? Um, so I think the more we open ourselves up to where stories come from, the more we can learn about ourselves and about others. I can't hear you. Thank you. You're muted, Anissa, I can't hear you. You are okay. Thanks, thanks. So, um, I also want to mention, though, uh, particularly to those of us who are listening to you, Stephanie, that she, that Stephanie is a, a fellow of the Abraham Path Initiative, and is writing a book, her third book, in fact, on the research that she's done over the past three or four years uh, in cultural heritage, intangible cultural heritage preservation, and it's got a rather intriguing title. Anwar's <laughs> Clementine. So Anwar is one of the subjects of this book. We've not heard about in this particular presentation. And and give the subtitle for us, Stephanie. Uh, well, sorry, you got me at a bad moment because I have maybe 12 subtitles. And... Oh, okay, well, whatever the, the current one, it has to do with how refugees can be our teachers and what we can learn from people and who... They can teach us about their history, but they can also teach us about resilience, um, about how we confront tragedy, about what we can do. What they've taught me is that everyone has the little thing they can do in any situation. Anwar is somebody who is from Mosul in Iraq. He had to um, escape. He took a very dangerous route to get to Europe. It took him six tries to cross the sea. Um, and he arrived in a terrible camp, and that's where I met him. Um, but everywhere in his journey, he helped people. During the, during the early years of the war in Iraq, he took his sisters to school, and he picked them up after school. Um, then when he was, even when he was escaping, he carried other people's children, he carried their bags. When I met him in the camp, he was helping people put up their tents. And every time he told a story, in that story was another story about how he found a way to help. 
Um, and when I was there, he started crying when he told me about all of the things in his city that had been destroyed. Then he went away and I thought, oh my goodness, I've lost him, where did he go? And when he came back, he had his hands cupped, he opened them up and there was a clementine in them, a little tiny orange that he gave to me. And I've never forgotten that. It was really a moment of deep despair. And inside himself, he said, I'm going to find the clementine in this moment. He went, he found a clementine and he gave it to me. Um, he's one of the bravest people I've ever met. Um, so over and over again, Hannah, I mean, she lost everything. Her house was burned down. Um, I found out when I went to go visit it. Um, everyone in her city fled. But what did she do? She realized that she could save the story of her city in a dress. Um, the way they've taught me that everyone in every situation has something small that they can do, but that thing matters more than we can possibly know. Um, you know, Abdul Latif planting his garden. I've told that story to hundreds and hundreds of people who have become inspired by his garden. Just because one day he woke up and said, I want to do something hopeful and he planted a garden. Um, so they've been a huge source of inspiration for me um, in my life. There are, there are questions here about hope a little bit more in depth. Would you say something about the role of hope in your work? And where do you find hope in the midst of so much sadness, Stephanie? Sure. Um, I think the question that I ask myself every day, and I think it's a very important question in this kind of work, is how do we see the world as it is and still find hope? Now, why do I say how do we see the world as it is and still find hope? I think this is a, a good question to ask even in the United States right now. There can be what I would call a cheap hope. That's a hope that we find by not looking at the hard things in front of us. And then we can feel good about ourselves um, and we can feel that everything's going to be okay, but actually we're not facing the difficulty. Or we can face the difficulty and lose hope. My husband speaks French and he taught me that despair in French actually just comes from the word de and then espoir. It means the lot lack of hope, the loss of hope. We despair when we don't have hope. So those are the two sides. You can either not really look at things and then you can be hopeful, or you can look at things and lose hope. But how do we stay in the middle? How do we actually look at things in the world and still have hope? And that's a choice and a journey that we take every single day. Um, I think that for me, friends are really important. Friends, I, I compare it to um, when I was pregnant, we would do something called a birth plan. That means that when you're in labor, you don't remember what you want to do. And so you write it down before, and I wrote down to my husband, I don't want an epidural. So then when I'm screaming, I want an epidural. He said, no, it says here, you don't want an epidural. Um, so with friends and with family, we say, I want to be somebody who's like this. I want to be peaceful. I want to always try to tell the truth. And then when we find that we're not really doing it, we can go to them and say, can I talk to you? Nobody can do this work alone. So it's really important to find friends it's really important to find a community and it's really important to find whatever it will take to sort of help you fill up um, to do this kind of work. Um, I also think we're not here to solve problems. Nobody can solve a problem as big as 70 million people who are displaced. But we each have our little thing to do. And I stay hopeful on the days I stay hopeful, which is not all the time, by focusing on the little thing that's mine to do and just trying to do that every day. Um, and gratitude, being grateful. If refugees have taught me anything, it's to be grateful for all of the things that we have, um, even while we're trying to make the world a better place. Thank, thank you for that. There's a question here. <laughs> Is there a way to connect with refugees? 
through letters between children and families? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I don't know of any, but that doesn't mean that it's not out there. Um, there there's so many different initiatives for refugees. Um, for example, depending on where you live, there might be refugees who arrived a few years ago in your own community. Um, and that's something that you could reach out, reach out to local organizations to find out. Um, I can look myself and see if there's a letter writing initiatives to write to um, other children. If you're a little bit older, there's really cool things. Like for example, there's um, projects to learn Arabic with Arabic, refu with Arabic speaking refugees who teach online, but at the same time, they're you know, earning a living and you're learning a language. Um, so there's lots of different ways of reaching out. The, the best way, I think, to get started is to see what's available in your own community. Um, and you can just look for some of the organizations that are working with refugees nearby. That makes a lot of sense. And I remember the whole pen pals, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember writing letters and, and putting them in an envelope and putting in a stamp on it, especially if they were airmail stamps and, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting in post office for something to come back. And, and sometimes there'd be a photo in there. And we can do that now with, with email and texting and do that much more quickly. So if you would with share with us. Yeah, with the people yeah. I work with, we leave messages so my phone is full of voices from people all over the world and maybe i can get from you later that that one where where we can study arabic and uh send it mm -hmm. out to the people who've joined us here i'm wondering from our audience if you would put in the in the chat or in the questions just to let us know how many children you have with you on this on this adventure on this journey we're taking together just so so we have an idea on our end who all is with sure. us I would love to know uh, how old they are too, and maybe where some people are, are tuning in from. Yeah, well, we know we have a contingent from San Antonio. And uh, we have here also Matthew Teller wrote in to say hello. Matthew is a journalist who's written extensively from the region. He's written a lot about the Abraham Path Initiative as well. He says, thank you so much for your great work. It's such a pleasure to see you and hear your insights. That's wishes. So let's see if we have um, uh, um, some more. Thank you for your friendship. Uh, people do want to follow follow up on a number of the subjects that we've that we've raised here. Uh, great gratitude. From, thing, go ahead, please. And I wanted to say, you know if you felt like you saw this and. Um, you wanted a bunch of your friends from school or others to hear the same presentation, just, you know, send us a group, set up 15, 20 people, and I would love to do it with a group that you know, and then afterwards you can talk to each other and brainstorm ideas about what you can do in your own community. So if this is something that you'd like to share with your friends, like I said, you know, half of the refugees in the world are under the age of 18. We're really counting on young people to start thinking about how the world can welcome, learn about, and um, just receive refugees differently than we have. I have put um, my email address and the connect at Abraham Path and the website also in our um, uh, chats. So it's available for all of you. Um, Sister Martha Ann says that your father helped out the um, UIW students, university, what would, I don't know what that stands for, but UIW students connect with refugees, and that has been continued. Our graduates are better people because they are friends with the newcomers to our city, so that's one of the local initiatives. She asks, how can we especially help our Hispanic students enjoy the cultural links with Islamic culture? Well, that's it. My father believed, my father was the director of Catholic Charities in San Antonio, and when he was alive, he created the largest um, program for giving asylum to refugees who didn't already have family in the country. Um, he brought Mendians um, from Iran. He brought a lot of people from the Middle East. Um, uh, people from all over the world, um, and he believed that 
San Antonio was a special place for welcoming refugees because it was a city where people were already living in two cultures. They were speaking Spanish and they were speaking English. And so because of that, people who were strangers would feel welcome there because they were living with people who already understood what it was to carry multiple identities. So with Hispanic students, they're really the perfect students actually to understand um, where Islam is coming from. Um, I mean, for me, I felt really strange when I went from San Antonio to the Northeast in the United States, but when I came to the Middle East, I felt right at home. You know, big meals, importance around holidays. So if you start with culture, if you start especially with feast days and food, then it's something that feels very, very familiar and the rest will just happen on its own. Um, coming, both, both communities have such an important sense of hospitality. I grew up with my grandmother. My grandmother had eight children and her house, tiny house, was full of people all the time. Um, this is the world that I grew up in. So feeding people, welcoming people, this is something in which the Hispanic community that I, in San Antonio and the Islamic community that I know both treasure. And so that's actually a very easy partnership. Great. We're still waiting for you to let us know how many of you are out there, how many children and how many parents. Um, but we are coming at the top of the hour. It's gone by so very, very quickly. If you want to keep following Stephanie in the handouts section in your control panel, you'll find a resources page that gives you her website and other ways you can keep an eye on what she's up to and what she's going to be doing. We also have an updated schedule of our API webinars uh, going through July, and uh, you'll find our 2019 annual report so you can discover a little bit more about what the Abraham Path Initiative is doing in that region we call the Middle East, that is on the continent of Asia, the Western side of Asia, as we showed you on that map. And uh, we are a nonprofit. We survive and we thrive with your generosity and your gifts. And we're able to help Stephanie get the work done that she needs to do, help give her travel money and, uh, and help support the writing of her book. And so if you are so moved, uh, we would be very grateful for your support. And you can find a place to donate at our website, www.abrahampath.org. Stephanie, I'd like you to have um the last word here um send us off with something not just hopeful but perhaps a little challenging i think you always have gentle challenge embedded in what you share with us well we're actually so. going to with a, with a music clip which i think that we're going to bring up which is by uh two friends of mine uh, two refugees that i profile their names are farhad faisal and hosen payel um, they're Kurdish musicians from northeastern Syria um, who had to escape the war into Turkey, um, where they decided to keep their traditional music alive. Um, but Farha, who's the guitar player, um, in the middle of this journey, he found out that his um, beloved sister had, um, had died. She'd been killed in a bomb. And then before that, he never sang. But that day when he heard that, he said he needed to sing he wasn't just preserving music, he wanted to preserve joy. Um, he taught me a lot of what it, what it means to find joy even in the most difficult situations. This little video that I took that you're going to see now has spread all over the world. I think it has 60,000 views on YouTube. And so he really is spreading joy all over the world while keeping his precious heritage alive. So I wanted more than anything I could say, I wanted you to end with, um, with what he has to say. Um, it's a song about, it's a love song. Um, and it, the language it's talking in is in Kurdish. So thank you. Contact us if uh, with more questions or if you want us to reach out to your communities. And there'll be a survey following this where you can fill us in in some of your information and uh, any of that follow-up information for questions and so on for Stephanie. Stephanie, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to be with you. And it's a pleasure to be with you out there in cyber world. I'm Anissa Mehdi. Here we leave you with NOFA.
Çok hakim 